Hey everyone, Scott here to discuss The Godfather Part 2, starring Al Pacino, Robert Duvall, Diane Keaton, Robert De Niro, John Cazell, Lee Strasberg, I don't know if I'm saying that right, please forgive me, Talia Shire, William Bowers, Giuseppe Salato, forgive me, and James Caan, and directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Now, I've seen this about once in my life. This is my second viewing to this movie. And let's see how this goes. Let's get into it. We open in 1901 with one story with Vito Corleone as, uh, was a, as a boy in Corleone, Sicily. And in another story in 1958 with Michael Corleone returned by Al Pacino. And we go back and forth between Michael as a godfather and Vito Corleone as a kid. And I'm not one going back and forth in movies, but the way this does it to tell Vito's story versus Michael's story makes a lot of sense to me. Some Same goes with how Vito comes to the city, and the audience knowing how he grew up to Marlon Brando from last time, in 1958, we see Michael at a wedding, like in the first film, as and we see his sister Connie returned by Talia Shire visiting her mother, which is well shot, but I did need another shot of a but did I need another shot of a wedding scene that takes a little while? Probably not. But it but is it topping the original's wedding? No. Because I liked the location last time better than this time. We get some more dialogue that works tremendously, but the movie itself as the writing is a little dense in both last time and this time, work, but at the same time it works very well, and the performances from Al Pacino and Talia Shire when she talks about needing more money for marriage is great. At night, Michael barely escapes an assassination attempt when his wife Kay, played by Michael, not Michael, Diane Keaton, noticing the bedroom window drops an inexplicable are explicably open, which allows two unseen hitmen to spray the bedroom with bullets. And I do like these scenes in the first 30 to 40 minutes, but after a while, it takes too long, as this is going to be a much denser movie than last time. In 1917, New York City, the adult Vito Corleone, played by Robert De Niro, lives in New York City with a newborn baby in a neighborhood controlled by a member of the Black Hand, Don Finucci, who extorts protection payment from local businesses. And I love De Niro as an actor, and he does quite well with this material. And he delivers a great performance as a young Marlon Brando. One night, Vito's neighbor, Clemenza, asks him for a, to hide his a stash of guns for him. And later on, as he repays the favor, takes him to a fancy apartment where they commit their first felony together. That is stealing an elephant rug, and I like this segment of De Niro as a young Marlon Brando more than Michael around for a second time, which the movie does as well. But I feel like this time the good. But I feel like this time the good, but somewhat weak stuff is Michael's story, in my opinion, anyways. Vito's story is much greater than Michael's story, in my opinion. As we flash forward to Michael's story and we meet Hyman Roth in Miami, Florida, who tells Michael that he believes Frank, let me see if I'm saying this name right, Penton Jolly was responsible for the assassination attempt and the Penton Jolly will pay for it, which felt believable, but we believe Michael is going mad by a head of a mobster and that's what makes his story the weakest is he's the same character he was at the end of the last movie where he does things himself. And Pacino's acting is great in this movie, but I personally prefer Vito's story because he seems more relatable this time than when we get than he was as Marlon Brando. Then Michael travels to Brooklyn and lets Penton Jelly know that Roth was actually behind it and that Michael has a plan to deal with Roth. But he needs Frankie to cooperate with the Rosado brothers in order to put Roth off guard and Pentangeli goes to meet with the Rosados 
at the local bar as he tells Michael Corleone, says hello, and he attacks from behind, but the attempted murder is accidentally interrupted by a policeman, and the Penton Jelly is left for dead, and that scene was violent and to the point that I like it. We're back in Nevada. Tom Hagen, played by Robert Duvall, blocks Kay from going out of the house for safety reasons. Meanwhile, Michael meets Roth in Havana, Cuba in late 1958 as a dictator. Let me see if I'm saying this name right. Fulgencio Batista is still citing American investment in communist guerrillas are trying to bring down the government. Michael mentions at a birthday party for Roth that the rebels might win, making their business dealings in Cuba problematic, as he earlier in that day had witnessed a com communist rebel killed a Havana policeman by detonating the gr a grenade that also killed the rebel himself. And I didn't mind the scenes in Havana, as it looks beautiful. Later on, Johnny Ola is strangled, but Roth is in a delicate state because of his heart condition, is taken to a hospital where Michael's enforcer is shot trying to kill him at Batista's New York New Year's Eve party, not New York, New Year's Eve party. At the stroke of midnight, Michael grasps Fredo tightly by the head and kisses him and says, I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. When guerrillas attack, the guests flee, but Fredo refuses to go with Michael, despite Michael pleas with Fredo that Fredo is still his brother, and that's the only way out. And I'm thinking Fredo is fucked, and can and can't get a way out, which is good filmmaking at best. In 1917, Vito's son is sick, and Don Fanucci of the Black Hand is now aware of the partnership between Vito, Clemenza, and Salticio and wants to share of their pro profits in Clemenza and Ticio agree to pay, but Vito is reluctant and asks his friends to leave everything in his hands, and Fanucci will accept less than indeed. Vito manages to get Fanucci to take one of the sixth of what he demanded, which is $100 out of $600. Immediately afterward, during the neighborhood festa, Vito murders Fanucci in the hallway outside of his apartment and then rejoins his wife and three children on the stoops outside of his tenement. Vito tells the infant Michael that his father leaves him, loves him very much as we move on to an intermission. And I'm liking this movie a lot, but I'm not lo loving it like as much as the first film. Which is the same idea with me from with Star Wars versus The Empire Strikes Back where I like the original much better. So much better, for that matter. The same thing is happening here with this trilogy. In January 1959, Nevada, Michael returns to his snow-covered Lake Tahoe compound fleeing Cuba, where Tom Hagen tells him that Roth escaped from Cuba, offer suffering a stroke, and is recovering in Miami that Michael's bodyguard is dead, and that Fredo is probably hiding in New York, Hagen also informs Michael that Kay has had a miscarriage while he was away. Michael is distraught at the news and furiously demands to know the sex of the child, but Tom is unable to tell him, and this scene was a little too melodramatic. And it works fine at best. In 1920, with Fenacci dead, with no, with no one else to take over the black hand, Vito earns the respect of the neighborhood and begins to intercede in local disputes operating out of the storefront of his Junko Pura oil company which is the name after his friend Junko Abandando which he manages as well as gives out love favors to others in the community such as a young local woman threatened with eviction Vito intimidates her landlord into letting her stay for a few extra weeks with rent free, and I buy this scene as a mob movie for talking into staying a few extra weeks rent free. I like these two movies as mob movies. In Washington, D.C. of 1959, a Senate committee of which Senator Geary is a member is conducting an instant or investigation into the Corleone family 
a question disaffected soldier Willie Chichi about his role for a button man in the family. I cannot implicate Michael because he never received any direct orders from him when Michael appears before the committee. Senator Geary makes a big show of supporting Italian-Americans and then excuses himself from the proceedings. During questioning, Michael denies all criminal allegations against him from the murder of Salazzo and Captain McCluskey back in 1946 in the first film and to his business status of operating several gambling casinos in Nevada. Michael makes a statement challenging the committee produce is a witness to corroborate the charge against him. The hearing ends with the chairman promising a witness who will do exactly that. And I love courtroom movies, but that scene is a little too long, slow for me, as it takes too long. Frank Pentangeli, who survived the attack by the Rosado brothers, has made a deal with the FBI and will testify against Michael. Tom Hagen and Michael discussed the problem observing that Roth's strategy to destroy Michael is well planned. Fredo has been found and persuaded to return to Nevada, and he explains to Michael his betrayal. And Michael is upset being passed over to, to head the family in favor of Michael. He wants respect, and his due to Fredo doesn't know they watched to kill they wanted to kill Michael. At the hearing in which Frank Pentangeli is to testify. Michael arrives accomplished Pentangeli's brother, brought from Sicily, whose pressure whose presence causes Frank to recant the his previous statements. For Michael, when Pentangeli is pressed, he claims that he just told the FBI what they wanted to hear, with no witnesses to testify against Michael. The committee adjourns with Hagen acting as Michael's lawyer, loudly demanding an apology, which is an again slowly paced. As a hotel room afterwards, Cade tries to leave Michael taking the, their children to, with her. Michael at first tries to mollify her, but loses his temper and hits her violently. When she reveals to him that her recent miscarriage was actually an abortion, to avoid providing another child into Michael's criminal inheritance. She also tells him that the baby was a boy, further infuriating Michael, when in a, which was a disturbing scene. In 1925, while visiting Sicily for a family vacation for the first time in over 20 years, Vito Corleone is introduced to the elderly 90-year-old Don Sico, or Sikio, as the man who imports their olive oil to America and who wants his blessing when Sikio asks Vito, Vito who his father was and re responds his name is Antonio and Dalini, cutting the old man's stomach with the knife, avenging the death of his father, mother, and brother. As they make their escape from Chico's compound and his men... Don Tomasello is shot in the leg by one of Seiko's bodyguards, giving him a permanent limp. And I very much enjoyed this last scene in the, in the Vito's world, as Robert De Niro pulls off Vito very well. In April 1959, Carmelia Corleone, who is Vito's widow, and the murder of his children dies, and the whole Corleone family is reunited for her funeral, Michael shuns Fredo, who is miserable, but relents when Connie implores him to. Michael and Fredo embrace, but at the same time, Michael signals to his capo that Fredo's protection from harm, in effect, while their mother lived, has now run out. Michael, Tom Hagen, and Rocco Lampone discuss their final dealings with Hyman Roth, who has been unsuccessfully seeking asylum for various countries and was even refused entry to Israel as a returned Jew, Michael rejects Hagen's advice that the Corleone family's position is secure and killing Roth and the Rosado brothers for revenge is an unnecessary risk. Later, Hagen pays a visit to the imprisoned Frank Pentangeli 
on a military base and suggests that Reed takes his own life in the manner of unsuccessful ancient Roman conspira conspirators who in return were promised that their families would be taken care of after their suicide. With the convenience of Connie, Kay visits her children but cannot bear to leave them and stays too long. When Michael arrives, he coldly closes the door in her face. As he arrives at an airport to be taken care of, taken to custody, I should rephrase that as, Hyman Roth is killed by Rocco Lampone, disguised as a journalist, who himself is immediately shot dead by Roth's bodyguards. On the military base, Frank Penn and Jelly is found dead, having followed Hagen's instructions and committed suicide in the bathtub. In his bathtub, I'll say. Fredo is murdered by Al Neri while they are fishing on Lake Tahoe. While Fredo is saying Hail Mary to help catch the, a fish, the, let me see if I'm saying this right, pen, penultimate scene takes place in 1941, and the Corleone family is preparing a surprise birthday party for their father, Vito. Sonny, returned briefly by James Kahn, introduces Carlo Rizzi, Connie's future husband and betrayer of Sonny and his, to his family. They, talk, they all talk about the recent attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, and Michael shocks everybody by announcing that he is enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Sonny ridicules Michael's choice, and Tom Hagen make, mentions how his father has great expectations for Michael, Fredo is the only one who supports his brother's decision. Sal Tessio comes in with the cake for the party with the cake. Never mind. And when Vito arrives, all but Michael leave the room to greet him. The final shot in the film is Michael sitting by himself at Lake Tahoe in silent contemplation. And the climax is sort of like the first film, but done a little differently in a weird kind of way. Now it's time for the rating. I'll give this movie a 8.3 out of 10. This movie is good, but not as good as the original. And just like Star Wars vs. The Empire Strikes Back, where I like the original so much better, I like seeing the Vito story more than the Michael stuff. And the next one is all about Michael, and I'll talk about that next time. And the movie is well shot, and the writing is good, but there were times the movie got a little tooling for me, too long for me. This is three hours and 22 minutes. I wish they cut 22 minutes out of this movie, but I still enjoyed it quite a bit. So I'd like to thank you guys for joining me, and next time I will be back with The Godfather Part 3. And until then, it's time to kiss your godfather goodnight.